Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next newest episode of the Paul Rivera Podcast. I am extremely excited and honored to announce our next guest, Omar Johnson. You may know him as the ex-CMO of Beats by Dre. We talk his entire journey from Brooklyn to Beverly Hills and everything in between. He's not only been a mentor and inspiration, but more importantly, a friend. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome. What's good, you. brother? I'm wonderful. So I always say this every show I have when I'm like, this person I have, I'm really excited to have on. But I'm going to take it to like a different level of like excitement. And I'm going to give one fact yep. that's going to let people know how connected you and I are. Yeah. And you know where I'm going. I know exactly where you're going. Right? So there are people in your life, it's, it's surprising enough and it's a short list when you meet someone yep. that has your same birthday. Right? Yep. You're like, oh shit, you were born. That's when I was born. Oh wow, it's great. It's shocking when it's within the same week. Yep. So Omar and I, we won't say the birthday, but Omar and I not only share a birthday, we share we share a birthday and a birth year. Yes, sir. So you and I were born on the were born. same day. <laughs> Our parents got busy on the same yes, day. Yes, <laughs> yes. What are the chances of that? It's what crazy. are the chances that you and I, you ever meet someone that's born on the same day as you? And what's crazy is it felt like it before we knew. Like, we so always crazy. had a connection. Facts. We always had an instinct. You, yo, if I'm looking right, you were always looking left. If I was Facts. looking up, you was looking business-wise, right? Um, and even a few nights where it wasn't business-wise, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. you was there. Yeah. Once or twice. And at the end of the day... You know, the moment we figured that out, I was like, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It made You're sense. Like, oh, of course, like, yeah. of course. So let's go back. I think a lot of people either think they know or know somewhat, you know, your professional story and yep. the amazing things you did at Beats. I want to talk a little bit before Beats, how, yep. we, how you got to Beats, and then I want to talk about how you architected and helped build Beats and yep. then what you're doing now. Perfect. Cool? Perfect. Omar Johnson the ten at 10 years old. Um, Where Bro- are you? Brooklyn, what are you doing? New York. Okay. Crown you said Heights. that proud too. You uh, said that I, like I a real Brooklyn it, man. Yeah, that's how we do. Like you stepped into the <laughs> yeah, mic. Yeah, like, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. New York. Um, I love it. Okay, Brooklyn. Crown Heights. Um, spent a lot of time between Crown Heights and Deep East New York. All my family was um, Brownsville, um, and that's where I came up. So that's where I grew up. That's where I went to elementary school. And what's funny you ask about ten years old is I was just talking to my mom. And my shout mom. Out to, shout out to my Dukes. Shout outs to my moms. By Mommy, the way, I love you. Mama, hey. listen, yo, she's going to give this to. My mom might get you more views than this <laughs> than anybody hey, else. By the way, I was randomly one night, Mav and I and Rich Paul were at <laughs> Wally's in Beverly Hills. <laughs> And me, and and Omar texts me and goes, "Hey, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ma Dukes is sitting right yes. next to y'all outside. Yes. So Ma Dukes knows where it's at. Still. Ma is on the scene. Yes, yes. If there's a scene to be had, <laughs> she's there. Mom gave me a, a a report card. She gave me a few report cards. Okay. And it was funny because I always got like B's and C's. This is recently. Recently. Okay. Recently. Um, in my tender age of of, of a lot right now, mm-hmm. got a lot of gray hairs now. <laughs> Our age. Yeah, we exactly. just discussed yeah, that. Exactly. Our age. You're young I, as that's shit. That's why. That's why I said no <laughs> numbers, right? But she gave me my report card, and it was funny because like I got good grades, but there's this word that kept coming up um, from eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and it was two words actually. One was potential, and the other one was disruptive. Mm. So that was like my upbringing. I actually came up in a way where I was in school, but I had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I always knew what I was doing. I always had the aptitude, but I always had a lot more fun than like learn. Mm-hmm. And um, what was crazy about when I grew up is a lot of my friends, I always say they ended up in a box, either jail cell, pine box, mm-hmm. right? That was those crazy years in the eighties in Brooklyn. Those are the crack years. And those are the years where, I mean, it was just war, yeah. right? And um, right on your doorstep, right on, on your side, doorstep. Yeah, no, you sure. I mean, I, I've seen people walk over people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so I grew up in those years, and it's funny because a friend was like, "Yo, you ever go back to Brooklyn?" I was like, "Yeah, you know, I go to Williamsburg. I'm like, <laughs> I go like, downtown. I, I love Bar- Dumbo. I go to Barclays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love Dumbo House. Beautiful. It's my favorite Soho house. And I was yes. like, "Yo, if somebody still there that knows me, they didn't escape." Mm. Like I escaped mm-hmm. as much as I love Brooklyn, rep Brooklyn every day with a hat, 
tattoo, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I escaped because it was crazy. Mm. And um, so at 10, it was two years before my father passed. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, my father was, was, my father actually played soccer. He played for the Cosmos. Oh, Nobody sure. knows that. But what was funny is in the 80s, playing soccer wasn't cool. It was not cool. Nah, because like I, and my father was like, yo, come play soccer. I would play. All my friends played basketball right. or football. And they would clown me. They'd be like, yo, you. Soccer. Yeah, yeah, soccer. Yeah. You crazy. And mm -hmm. It was just this thing. And um, I'd play a little soccer at school. Dad was there. But 10 years old was two years um, before my dad passed. So me and my wow. dad was like rolling on the weekends. It was my mom during the week. They were separated. Wow. I lived in East New York. I always ask that because I think there are tentpole years in one's life that mm -hmm. even the mention of them automatically takes you to a place. And you yep. see it so clear, yep. right? So let's go from 10-year-old Omar Johnson, senior year in high school. Like, what are you into? Do you think you know what you want to do? Like, what's yeah, important yeah, in your yeah, world? Yeah. Then? Crazy. So same thing. Um, decent grades, still being disruptive, always curious. But I was always hustling. I was always selling something, right? So I got my mom put me in a school, a private school in Bay Ridge, which was crazy because I had to go all the way from East New York. I used to go to Brownsville, Atlantic Terminal, so all of the craziest parts of Brooklyn. Then I had to go through Bensonhurst and mm. Bay Ridge, mm. which during the 80s is like people was getting like black guys didn't go to Bensonhurst. Right. Like black guys got killed in Bensonhurst. Yeah. So I went to school up there. And um, what was crazy is I was always, like, finding ways to make money. So I would, like, buy sodas at the supermarket and sell them in my locker, which obviously you shouldn't do in school. Like, you're not <laughs> supposed to sell sodas. But I was making good bread. Like, mm -hmm. I would spend, you know, three bucks three bucks to buy a 12-pack, and I would sell it for a dollar. So I was making good mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, smart academically, but we'll get in trouble for stuff like that. You know, one day I was making a little flyer for myself, for my soda, for my soda business. Mm -hmm. And I had the box cutter that I was using to cut out the, the, the sign. Mm -hmm. And I left the box. My mother was cleaning off the kitchen table, put the box cutter in my book bag. I go to school. A black kid right. with a oh, box, yeah, a box cutter, cutter in his cutter. backpack? You get it. You get Shit. it. You get it. Yeah. My mom's was dead. She yeah. was like, I put it in his bag. Yeah. She's not a bad kid. But mm -hmm. it was that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, senior year was a good year for me because I got, I started getting all of these interest letters from college. Um, I didn't know what to do with them, but I just got them, and I thought I was going to go to college. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually I graduated, so I graduated. And um, that's when we moved to Atlanta. Um, so you moved to Atlanta. You go to school at, where do you go to school at? Uh, in Georgia. So I started at Morris Brown, which okay. is a historically black college. Yep. yep. Um, then I ended up finishing at Georgia State. So um, do you go to grad school? Um, later. So uh, I went. I graduated with a biology, biology degree, chemistry minor, so... Anybody who ever thinks, like, Smart if you guy, start man. off in, like, some place you can't end up where you really want to be, like, I did that. Like, I literally have the biology degree, chemistry degree. I did a year of, like, research. Like, I was, like, I did a year of physiology research. I've been published. Like, if you look up my name and Fiddler Crabs, you'll actually find the publishing of, like, the research I did. So it's, it's crazy, like, that I did that. I'm going to tell you right now, you're way humbler than I would be. Like, you wouldn't be able to talk to me without me being like, man, what? What time is it? I'm published, dog. <laughs> like, you're asking me what time it is, man. Like, that's, that's a, I, didn't, I didn't even know that. No, I didn't know you were published. That's a big deal. No, a big... So, so you finish school. How do you end up at Nike? Okay, so um, finished school, thought that I was going to be – I want to be a doctor like Cliff Huxtable. <laughs> Notice I didn't say Bill Cosby, yeah. right? Speak yeah, clear. Yes. Cliff Huxtable. I see what right? you did there. I watched, I watched the Cosby yeah. show. He made a lot of bread. I was like, I'll make a lot of bread, and I'm kind of smart. So uh, I did the science thing. I had a doctor say to me, like, yo, you don't really want to be a doctor. You don't like doctor's lifestyle. You can't drink wine. You can't stay up late. Like, and I was like, oh, you're right. But I paid my way through school by selling mixtapes and DJing. So I had a lady who worked with Coke, and she'd say, yo, Go to these parties, DJ, tell me what people are wearing, what they're drinking, what they're dancing to. And I would do that. I didn't know I was doing marketing. Mm -hmm. I just knew I was a cool kid who would go in the rooms and talk about youth culture. I started getting paid a lot of money for it. And I was like, I like this. I get to go to parties. Mm -hmm. I get to go show up in boardrooms and build plans that was connected to people and culture. So I've been, I started doing it like like authentically in the street, just like as a DJ. Before but, you even knew you were doing it. Yeah, I had right. no clue what right. marketing was and yep. brand management was. No clue. Um, and then a mentor was like, yo, you should go get an MBA. 
because you got this science degree. You can't really get a, a, a real job in marketing. You can get an agency job, mm -hmm. but you can't get a job in a brand, mm -hmm. which is So I got my MBA. I went back to Emory in Atlanta. Um, got my master's, and then I went to Campbell Soup, um, Kraft Foods, worked on Chips Ahoy, which is, I got a dope story about that, because this guy told me I would never be good enough to be a brand manager. Like, I still wear, I still wear it on my show, <laughs> on my chest. Like, yeah. That's a bit, the irony. Um, so, you know, did that, and then Nike recruited me from Cam from Campbell Soup. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you you know, you said your dad played soccer. Yep. Um, you played soccer, played, you know, multiple sports growing up, been a fan of sport. What's it like when Nike, like... You know the done. You know what it sports, feels like. Right? It's everything. It feels like everything. Right? It's like, it's like you're done. You got drafted. Yeah, you're done. You're like, not, not, you don't get. You, yeah, you're in the league, league, league. Like, I don't even know if it's drafted, fam. I feels like the all star team, mm. right? It feels like even bigger than being a pro because, like, I agree. you're in a big company. You make a good salary. Going to Nike feels like mm. playing for the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. playing for the Yankees. Yeah. So, um, what's your first job at Nike? So, um, they... assistant brand manager or marketing associate. That okay. was the title. Associate brand manager. Associate, yeah. Yes. I think it was marketing yes. associate. They came up with some new stuff yes. when I came but, in. By the way, when, when I don't know if I'll tell you this story. When I got hired at Nike, which obviously we met at Nike, when I got hired at Nike, it was for an associate brand manager of basketball. And I will say this now, and it's not to shit on, it's a lot of money, a little money, it's all relative, but when they told me I was going to make $70,000 a year. No, we was done. No, I called Dog, I called my mom. I was like, yo, you don't got to work no it's more. Rap. We did it. Yeah. She was like, boy, if you don't carry your ass to work, <laughs> if you don't carry your ass to work on Monday, what? Like, So, like, to your point, working at the swoosh and getting that call and being in sports was, like, not only a big deal, it was everything, right? It's so, everything, and you think the rest of your life is figured out. Mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. like, I made it. I'm so, here. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I might run the place, but. I'm done. I'm in a great place. I get to travel. Yeah, I was done. Made it. So you're associate brand manager uh, category? Are you in? What are, what so you I in? came into this really interesting program that was a rotational program. Mm -hmm. So I was in U.S. brand, global brand. I was in um, PR and U.S. retail. So I rotated every um, six months for the first two years. And then I ended up in brand connections, which was a, a, a hybrid of advertising and digital content. Mm -hmm. And did you have a uh, background, expertise, or passion for advertising at that point? Nah, but what they did, crazy about life, what they did is they put me in, so we had launched Nike Plus, which was the first time the shoes talked to the iPod. Yep. They put me in that group to make mixes of music to power it. So I had to build content for the Apple ecosystem. Mm. Mixtapes. Right, right back to the yeah, Right back to the mixtapes yep. I sold in the flea market. Yep. But like literally that came back and I ended up helping build content, original music. We made like an original album with De La Soul, a bunch of talent. And then we had these mixes with record labels. And actually the record labels were paying Nike to use the music. So we actually flipped the model, mm -hmm. but we were making money selling music. Mm. But I did that, um, and then I went to advertising. So my last stop at Nike was advertising. So two years I built content, next two years was all advertising. Got it. And then, as fate would have it, a little company that sells little headphones called Beats by Dre calls you. Yeah. What's your wait, 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 You need to hear the story. So two years before Beats called me, I'm doing this deal, the music deal mm -hmm. for Apple. I said, I got to go find the most progressive music industry guy on the planet. Guess who that guy is? Jimmy Iovine. Jimmy Iovine. <laughs> All so, roads in music oh. lead to Jimmy Iovine. So, <laughs> I, I never forget this meeting because it was like one of those like, weird meetings where I go meet Jimmy. I'm at the music label, Interscope, and there's basically 40 people in the room. So 40, 4 zero? 40. 40 people wow. in the room. Okay. And I don't think, I think out of the 40, it was one person that wanted this deal to go through. Mm -hmm. Because we were asking that Nike got a revenue split in music, and it was a really progressive deal. Mm -hmm. So I'm presenting my slides. Jimmy walks in the room late, meeting starts. He's like, go. Right? So I present, I got 24 slides. I get to slide number four. He stops. He says, what the fuck are you talking about? Wow. You're at Nike. My stock is going this direction down. Your stock is going way up, and you want my fucking music? So first of all, I'm like, yo, who talks to people like this? Right. And me, Nike never, we never, right. do, we get rowdy at Nike. We don't do that. Right. So I'm like, shell-shocked. How old are you at this point? Ballpark? 20, 20s, late, wow. tw mid-20s. And you're here in 
So there's 40 people, 40 grown ups in the room. I'm the youngest, blackest guy in the room. Like it, it, it literally is all executives in me. And you're locked in with probably the most bullish, most successful, yeah. most seasoned music yeah. exec in the business. Yeah. So he hits me with that. And it was funny because then, then Brooklyn comes out because like you, you don't really have no recovery to that outside of like where you come from. And I was like, yo, are you in- interested in making more money than you make right now? And he was like, what? I said, do you want to make more money than you make right now? He said, yeah. I said, can I finish? I had 24 slides. I got the slide 16. He said, stop. You sign the deal. You go make a, a studio session tonight. We're going to mix one tonight. The deal went from who the fuck are you to we're signing the deal today. Within 16 slides. 16 slides. Wow. And I think 90% of it happened in that moment where I stood up to him. And mm-hmm. then I think the rest of it was, it was actually a good idea. Now, is are you going to them, is he... Um, Chairman or CEO of Interscope, or is, is Beats? Oh, he's the boss. Be- does Beats exist then? In so that Beats doesn't really exist. Okay. Beats is kind of an idea. A side I think hustle he had, that they had at the time. Because gotcha. he was placing products in music videos in a successful way. Yep. But it was like, what's that right product that you build around somebody like Dr. Dre? Gotcha. So then over those two years, I started seeing the headphones on the table when I would go mm-hmm. visit Jimmy. And then, like, I remember after the first year, Nike's like, yo, we have a royalty check for Interscope. We're going to wire it. I was like, hell no, you ain't. Give me a paper check. <laughs> He's going to see my face and feel his check come across the table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First check was like $3 million. Mm. So I answered my promise to him a year ago. Mm. Next year, another big year. Mm-hmm. Simultaneously, he's building his headphone company. And um, he mentioned it to me. And then again, goofy marketing guys like, did you do market research? Like, what, do, what, are your, what did you do a focus group? Mm-hmm. That's all I knew. It's like, did you do a focus group? And he would look at me like I had two heads. He was like, no, it's just a good idea. Dre likes it. Pharrell likes it. Will I Am likes it. We are the focus group. (laughs) (laughs) Which is, as as we all have come to learn. We we drive culture. Right, right. So, but again, in my head, I'm like, yo, you're not being disciplined. And Mm -hmm. he's just looking at me like I have four heads, right? But he says to me at some point, I'm building this headphone company. And he's like, I want you to think about it. I leave... I fly into Portland. Now, you know what this feels like. When you fly from somewhere else into Portland, it's sunny, and then there's this moment where you go below the clouds, and you're like, I'm back. Because Portland, as you know, is is, is not sunny 10 months a year. You, you know you know what I, uh, my uh, analogy for landing back in Portland from traveling is? And, and, and I have friends in Portland. It's we have friends so, in Portland. We have tons of friends. I you, love Portland. You, but. you know the sound in the Beats pill when you turn it off? It's like, beers. <laughs> That's how I felt every time I landed back in Portland, like turning off. A Sorry to all our friends oh, there. Man. You know exactly nah, what we're talking love. about. It's all love. Let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Oh, it's like because I went through it, and I and I definitely want your opinion. A lot of people, young professionals, whether they're people that are friends of the program, whether they're you know people that I don't know that hit me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever the case is, a lot of people struggle with what's the right move to make and what's the right time to make, right? Yeah. And I ask that, or I preface it by saying. You, know, you were at Nike, it's the New York Yankees, right? Yeah. And your career was just starting there. There's no bigger, more successful, more exciting company than Nike. And here's this little company called Beats by Dre. They People sell said we were crazy, right? So it's like at that point for you, and it's they diff- were laughing it's at us. Different for you everyone. A hundred. They laughed at us. What influenced the decision for you to make? What was right for Omar Johnson to make that move? You know, it was really simple for me. One um, was the one thing that. If you look at Jimmy Iovine's track record, he's a talent hound. He knows where, that's why he connected with Mav, that's how, that's where, um, um, what was the first film they made with, with LeBron? What was uh, that movie? Uh, more Than a Game. Right, right. right. Yep. He didn't make a lot of, there was Eight Mile and like yeah. More Than a Game. <laughs> right, right. He picks, ta- he M- smells. Eminem and Bron, those are two pretty he, good bets. He smells talent. Mm-hmm. And the moment he chose me, as much as I'm like, oh, I'm at Nike, I'm like, he sees, and he's, I think he saw more in me than I even saw. Hmm. So when you, to your point, like when you move, you move when there's an interesting idea, and more importantly, there's an interesting person that believes in you who's saying come. Mm-hmm. And those two things for me made me make the move, in addition to the weather. Like he, he happened to call me when I was driving up from a Kobe Bryant meeting. I used to always get a convertible in LA just to absorb as much <laughs> fucking sun as I could. He calls me, Berman calls me in a car as I'm driving up in the convertible from Newport Beach. And like, mm. we want to see you today. Wow. 
So we know Beats, what it's become, what it was when you were there, what it is today, successful. You see athletes wearing it, which we'll get yeah, into yeah. that in a second, all those things. Yeah, yeah. That's not the Beats you walked into on day one. Talk to nah. me about what the brand, what, what, what's the vibe around Beats, the brand, when, on your first day, what, you, what you've seen. Ah, my first day, we're in a corner of an office in the back of Interscope. So if Interscope Records had a coat closet, Mm-hmm. We was in that coat closet. That was the Beats like, office? That was the Beats headquarters? That was the Beats headquarters. You know, I had a desk. I think I paid $400 for it. And we had five people. Um, two of them, you know, um, were moved. Mm-hmm. And then it was three of us. Wow. And then there were three. So that was the Beats marketing team. That was the Beats marketing team. Beats, is, as everybody, Beats was all marketing before Beats was anything else. Of course. We were a marketing team and our phone headphones were manufactured outside. And then we vertically integrated later. Mm-hmm. But... Beats was a marketing entity to start. What, in your opinion, early on in your career, because there was a bunch of you know pivotal moments, but yeah, yeah. early on in your career, what was the f- what was the first thing at Beats that was like, oh, we got something like this is like we're we're turning the corner on this Ooh, thing. Oh, good question. The first one, and it may be just for you personally, internally at the world didn't see, but what made you think, oh, this is a real thing? We got a real shot. Yeah, what was that's a great question because it's making me think, and I think there's two parts to it. So. Jimmy Iovine had mastered the idea of putting headphones in music videos and in music. He just had that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Omar Johnson comes, and I'm basically replicating what Jimmy's doing, right? I did stuff with Pharrell, and every time I did something, he was like, oh, well, he did that because of me, or he did that. Like, everything was connected back to him. Mm -hmm. In terms of, like, placing Beats product in music videos or whatever, right? And and rightfully so, he was like, yo, because of something I did in the past, that happened for you. Mm. And I was like, hell no, nah. like I gotta find my wins. I gotta get some Omar wins. Mm-hmm. And I think the the timing of that and then with some of the things happening with our, one of our friends, Mav, in sports, I'm like, yo, you look at John McEnroe and all the history of sports, like athletes and headphones was a thing a long time ago, but it went away. Mm-hmm. As headphones got smaller, it went away. Mm-hmm. And we knew there was a lane for it, and I was like, well, I can never do what Jimmy does. And right. I think that's, I can't out Jimmy, Jimmy. This, but this right. is this is leaders. And I'm saying this because this plays out a few times over where it's like you don't chase the old guy's playbook. Mm-hmm. You learn from it, but you got to build on top of it. So mm-hmm. and when I say old, I don't mean old in age. I mean, no, of course. the guy before yeah, you pedigree. Right. Yeah. yeah you yeah. don't just try and like because, you know, I'm like, look, you can try to do what Omar Johnson did, but you need to do what you do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm not going to do I'm, I'll never be Jimmy or being Jimmy. But I'm like, if I can bring another genre to this, and when I started seeing what we could do in sports, more notably, like the NFL was just a weird, it was a weird time for the NFL because this whole new genre of like loud black quarterbacks mm-hmm. was happening. Yeah. You remember? It was mm-hmm. like, it, they were black quarterbacks before, but they weren't outspoken. Mm-hmm. They weren't wearing braids. They weren't like. Uh, you got Cam, Superman. Yeah, yes, you, you yeah, had that swag. Yeah, yeah. And it was the, for me, when you, the quarterback, the most important person on the team, most visible person on the team. But then it was us. Mm-hmm. And they were talking, they talked. And you saw that genre happening. And then what Braun started doing with like, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm wearing product. You're going to see it. I'm going to wear it in press interviews. Mm-hmm. You're going to see it in the podium. So as you started to see those things happen, I'm like, oh, we got one. Because the music thing I knew was going to happen. And I, that's where beat started. But the sports thing was like, because if we get basketball, we get soccer, mm-hmm. we get rugby. Because we, we know the power of like those athletes. A lot of other athletes look to them for like what's what. So the moment I saw us doing what we did with those black quarterbacks and then basketball, I'm like, there's a whole other genre of marketing we can do mm-hmm. that I can go and create, you know, if given the permission to do it. And like I said, Jimmy's a talent hound. He heard that strategy and he was like, you know, he's one of those people that's like, if you, when you have the right answer, he's like, why are you still standing here? Like, run. Mm-hmm. And that was what I did. I have a, a, a Jimmy story. So obviously, uh, you know, people that know me know, I, you know, Omar actually brought, you brought me to Beats and mm-hmm. I worked for O and, mm-hmm. and I remember, <laughs> I remember the um, we did the, the B campaign. Yep. And we had shot the campaign. Yep. Right. We we're in a studio in, in in Santa Monica where the old Beats headquarters were. <laughs> and you know we rap. Everyone's like you know 
you know, toasting champagne and shit, and it's great and all this stuff, and and you know, hugs and double kisses, and the director leaves and everything. And we're done. We wrapped. It's done. It's a celebration. We have a campaign in the can. Yep. And O comes over to my desk and he goes, "The next. This is the next day." Yep. O comes over to my desk. I don't know if you remember this. And he goes, "Hey, um, need you to come with me. We're gonna go meet with Jimmy. He wants to meet with us." And I said, um, "Okay." So we walk across the street, Interscope's across the street. We walk into this big ass conference That's room. That's the same conference room. That's from your meeting? Yeah, <laughs> That's the same big ass conference room. People, and similar to 40, 40 people. Probably the same 40 motherfuckers in the meeting, <laughs> right? 40 people in the meeting. Jimmy's at the head of the table, and Will I Am's at the head of the table. Yep. And you and I walk in, and he goes, I want to show you guys something. Yep. Hit it. And they show, uh, was it Britney Spears? They show Britney Spears and Will I Am, the song, show, the remix. Right? They show a Britney and Will I Am, you know, remix. And they show, and the song's dope, right? It's like high energy, it's all this stuff, you know, it's Britney, bitch, like it's all yeah. that. And it's like, we're you like, know, yo, it's dope. This shit's fire, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, oh, cool. Like, is he yeah. here to ask us what we think? We're like, yeah, thumbs this up, is great. fire. Yeah, this is great. He goes, I want this in the spot. Yep. So I'm like, that's dope. It should be in a spot. What spot? Because we wrapped our spot yep. yesterday. Yep. Wait, 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 more context. That was a Thanksgiving spot. <laughs> yes. Anybody in advertising yes. knows all the logs close on Tuesday. Mm. This meeting is on a Friday, which meant that it needed to be done. Yeah, it's all like it's finished. Two that's, weeks that's before. Spot. No, it, we're like it shipped. Spot sh- yeah, it's, it's done. Shipped. Jimmy goes I think I said it shipped, and he yeah. looked at me like I had four yeah, heads. He's like, No, 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 I want it. I want this 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 yeah. uh spot. Yeah. And we were like, We're like, we can't. But he wasn't even like I think at that point by the by the time we had even mouthed we can't he was hearing Charlie Brown like wah 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 yeah. he's like great yeah. so get the studio today yeah. we could have him in an hour well I am can you get your stylist here can you and we're like no and no no the, Jimmy this can't happen we don't even know where the fuck the director is and I think he wraps the meeting yes me and you are sitting there saying yes. no and he's like okay thanks everybody meeting's thanks, over thanks for coming this will be great this is gonna be amazing. <laughs> See you on TV on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that's, that's how it literally is. how it happened. We're not exaggerating anything. And then it gets worse. Do you but, remember he tells us, "Don't let this guy out of your sight. I love him, but he'll disappear." Wait. So, but Will I am, and Will's like, "Jimmy, I'm right here. I can hear you." Oh. And he was, he was like, "No, listen, I love you, but your talent." He told me, "Do not let Will I am out of your sight because he'll disappear, and then we can't do the spot." And literally, Will. All due respect, love you, Will. You know that. It's a genius. Will tried to leave four times. Thousand he, percent. He, he tried to hustle you. He was like, he was I, need with, I need a haircut. He I tried to go have to the, the bathroom. <laughs> hey, Will I am was like, I need a haircut. And I was like, cool, we'll have your barber come here. He's like, cool. Damn. Cool. He's like, got me. So I got to go see my stylist. I'm like, no, your stylist will come here. He's like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so give me the address. I'll get, you know, I'll... Uh, I'm going to drive. And we're like, no, 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 I'll go with you. Like, he was trying every Everything single thing could. possible to go. You find the, the directors, if I'm lying, I'm flying. He's literally at the airport. Yep. About, about to, to go leave. on vacation, yep. whatever. We shoot that fucking campaign over that day. That day, there's a whole production crew that got behind us and did it. And to P's point, like, and like I said, Will, I love you. Will was trying to escape. <laughs> like, I think he literally rode in the passenger seat. And Will tried to get on the full on the ten, and he was like, "Nah, no, 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 the studio's no. right." There. No, no, we're right here, boss. And literally pulled over the car, got him out the car, and four or five times on set, he tried to walk outside, and you followed him outside. Here's the beauty of it, and you'll appreciate this more than anyone. Jimmy was absolutely unequivocally right. Oh, ten thousand percent. It was always the is. right call. The spot was incredible. It was way better than the spot we were gonna do. It was just blew my mind. But for him, and it taught me, it was like. It's not my issue to figure out how to make this work. This is the right thing to do. Make it work. It has to happen. Yep. You yep. know, and I think we both come from that school, like, get it done. You, you know? So we were, we were able to get out of our own way. Mm. Like, we had all these barriers in our head around, yo, we can't do it, timelines, blah, blah, blah. And mm. he's like, Process, nah. yeah. He's like, nah. And the funny thing is, if we didn't do it, he still would have did it. He would have figured out a way. But yeah. who would have lost? It would have been would've... like, oh, you're telling me you can't do it? Right. No problem. Right. Get out the way. Got it. You got to do got it. Got it. Right? Watch it. I think for me, I asked you, you know, just a minute ago, what was that pivotal moment for you that you knew this thing had a shot to go all the way or whatnot? And there was a moment for me, now me being at Beats, and uh, I had nothing to do with the moment, um, but it was more so a moment I saw for you where I was like, oh shit, like, we've arrived. There was two moments. The first one is the ESPN mag cover with mm-hmm. Dre and LeBron. Yep. And it was like Beats by Dre takes over the locker room or something like that. Yep. Talk a little bit about that, like that moment and what it meant like for you personally and for the brand. It meant it was real. 
we all saw it in our head. Like, we knew the authentic relationship. And the, the crazy thing about Dre and Braun, and again, you know, because we know these guys, I'm always very sensitive, but, like, there's always a ton of, like, mutual respect. But they weren't, like, super close friends. Like, they just, right. there was a ton right. of respect. Respect to each other, come like, up, So when you business, get to, yeah. nobody even knows, like, to get two guys like that on the same, the ego alone. Oh, my God. To share a cover with two legends in two different categories, it's crazy. Well, it's even like ego, even logistically, to get those guys in the same room. But it was respect. Like yes. they, they both loved and respected each other for what they did yes. and, and their focus on their craft. And to your point, like I think it was a crowning moment because we've always knew like this sports thing was just as big as music. Mm -hmm. But that's where you started to see, I don't want to say the changing of the guard, but when you started to see sports really come into its own, where sports wasn't just sports. Sports is a platform that was really big and rivaled, if anything, music. Yeah. We always knew athletes wanted to be artists and artists wanted to be of athletes. Of course. But that wasn't in, you didn't see that play out in the media. Right. Like the artists always had like the, right. the swaggy right. thing, right. Yeah, the cars, the clothes, yep. the girls, and the athletes, they only captured the athletes on, a, on the court. Yep. But this is one of the first times where you start to see an athlete as a business guy. A musician is a business guy, and they both have side jobs mm -hmm. that they're both amazing at. Mm -hmm. So to your point, like it was just a seminal moment where you're like, if ESPN sees it, there's a lot of yes. other people who now see it. Yes, yes. The the that, so that was the first moment. The second moment when I was like, holy shit! Like the brand and oh, personally, are out of here. Was um, World Cup. Yep. So you do a World Cup spot. And actually, it's in this office. By that time, I had left and started, you know, my own thing. Yep. And you come over. We were still working together, right? At that point, I'm on the client side. And you come over to me you're like, yo, I got something I got to show you. And you, I knew it was good before I saw it because you were excited. Yep. Right? Yep. And for, the, for those of you that don't know, Omar's a hater. He hates everything, everyone, nothing's <laughs> dope. Nothing's ever dope. Everything could be standards. better. I got high so if he's excited about something, it's dope. So he comes to me he's like, I got to show you something. And you proceed to show me an edit of the World Cup beat spot yep. with Neymar and yep. his dad, with Junior and his dad. Yep. Do you remember what I told you what my feedback was? Don't change anything. I said you can only fuck this you said up. You're going, I said you're going to fuck Don't it up. Don't change a thing. <laughs> you that. can only fuck this up. Very true. Do you remember what Ad Age said about the spot? It yeah, said, I remember exactly what it said. Beats out Nike. No, no, no. Nike. That was, remember... You you had it, I had it, we still have it. There's a chip on your shoulder. When mm -hmm. we when you when I left Nike, the world's small. People was talking. Especially our world. Yo, world. they that's stupid. Mm -hmm. You don't leave Nike. Mm -hmm. You and the Yankees. That's stupid. Or they're gonna come back begging for their job. Mm -hmm. I heard every version of that. So I had a huge chip on my shoulder and I was like, yo, I never thought I could catch that. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I'm a die trying. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like when that headline came out, we didn't have no influence over that. But it was like we just what, what what nobody else was talking about is we had like the the um hear what you want. We had just run the gamut of like NBA, NFL, and then we hit World Cup. Mm -hmm. So like a back back to By all the way, the, all on the heels of like Olympics. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like we we, we had hit like these yes. things where like every moment that Nike was used to dominate, we were there. Mm-hmm. And they're first. And in a younger, cooler, you were just there. more anti the yeah. machine so type I, thing. To, to your point, like, and I know now I know, you know, I think that we had some big moments at Beats. There was a sports thing, the ESPN cover, and then that article was framed in my office mm. because it was that moment where, like, everybody who ever says something about me, mm -hmm. eat that. So it's like, to be clear, it was at age, which is one, mm -hmm. one of the, if not the most respected, you know, publications, houses, as it relates to just anything media and, you know, content. Yep. And the headline on the front page was Beats Out Nike's Nike. Yeah. And it was talking about the World Cup spot. Yeah, Google that. Yeah, how'd that feel for you? Like, it had to be a full circle moment great. for you, right? You, felt, like, you know, you, you felt this before. You leave somewhere because it's not right or there's something better. You, back to the question, like, when you leave. You leave something when you know, like, I can go do something different, better, bigger. We left. There's all these opinions around you of what you should do with your career. Mm -hmm. Being as young as we were, because mm -hmm. we were super young. Mm -hmm. We're still super young. Babies. Super babies. At the end of the day, you made a call and it paid off. That feels good. Mm. Right? And that article for me was like, yo, you're in a place now where you've, mm. you've, you've did it. 
-hmm. Now what's next? And like we try to compete at a whole different level. You remember that? Like we just competed in a different way. We was animals at it. So perfect transition. You have literally the best athletes in the world signed to your brand. Mm -hmm. You have LeBron James, Cam Newton, Neymar, Serena. I mean, you go down the list. You know, Nigel Houston. Like just mm -hmm. not just traditional sports, skating, tennis, just literally everything. Fashion, Schweinsteiger, downhill you, you skiers, countries, rugby. You have Antoine everything, Griezmann, right? Yeah. You have all the accolades. You have Beats Out Nikes, Nike. You know, you're winning, you know, Con, you know, uh, it was a Can Lion Awards. We right? got a lot. Right? Yeah, you're winning a lot. awards. It's a lot. You're in Fast Cup. You're in all these things, and you decide it's time for the next thing. Yep. Did it feel any different? Although, obviously, you're at a much higher level. Did it feel any different, the thought process, than it did when you left Nike to go Beats? Wow, great question. So, so to add some more context, we grew the brand really big. We went from when I got there, twenty million to about one point six billion in revenue. Talk so your shit. Say it yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, Say it again. Some numbers. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. It's just so factual. Like, <laughs> it's, it's factual. factual. You can look it up. <laughs> but the numbers were the numbers were big, and we did that all in four years. Right. Mm -hmm. We did that in four years. So wait, like, I want to spend a little bit of time there. Two hundred to no twenty. Twenty it's about twenty mil. Twenty mil very early to one one point six billion in four years in revenue. Jesus. Numbers was crazy. So we, we drive this huge growth, and then we get this world's biggest company, or probably world's biggest company now, Apple, comes mm -hmm. in and buys us. Mm -hmm. Comes in and buys us. So for us, it was like, you know, you left, you built something, you got acquired. We were all happy. We all did Everybody really, made some money. Yeah, everybody, right? made, yep. did money, everybody made money on a deal. It was, yep. it was a great deal. Great. And then I became an executive at Apple. And what was interesting was, you, again, you're like, yo. If that was the Yankees, I don't, even, I don't know what Apple is. Apple's, I don't, I don't know. They beat, I don't know. Fucking monster. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah know. I don't, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the monster. It's the monsters, right? Yeah. And then, you know, for me, what was interesting was as much as it was this bigger company, I felt like I was at when I was at Nike, like it, it felt very different for me, and I felt like there was something else. Mm -hmm. So I spent two years, about two years and six months at Apple. And when it was time to go, it was very obvious to me. So you, you, when you think about the accolades, that was all beats related. At Apple, we kept winning awards, but like mm -hmm. you know me, I'm always on to the next thing. Of course. And the next thing just didn't feel as fast or fulfilling as the first thing. Mm -hmm. And I knew those days were numbered. Mm -hmm. And then I, I left. I made the call. But it felt like Nike because I, you know, most people, I've probably turned down more CMO jobs than most people ever get. Mm -hmm. Meaning. I was in that space of yeah. like you got all the opportunity and then you move. Yeah. I remember honestly the craziest thing wasn't when you called me and told me, "Hey, I think I'm going to make a move and I'm going to bounce." That cuz we had already been having those conversations like, "Yo, you're like fish grease hot. Like you you're killing campaigns of the year. You're doing this stuff. You're signing these athletes. Like the stars are lining up. Like you're signing this athlete, he's winning MVP. They're winning gold. Like it couldn't have lined up any better for you, yep. right? And for the brand. So when you told me you were thinking about leaving or you were going to leave, you had made the decision to leave. I know where you're going. I, I wasn't necessarily shocked. Like I was like, oh, right. I get it. It's time. I get right. it. The next thing. I was shocked when I asked you, what are you going to do next? Yep. And you said, I don't know. Yep. And I was like, oh, hell no. No no one leaves a job. And no one leaves a fucking amazing job and they're not sure what they're going to do next. And you were like, I'm not sure. I obviously have options. I could take other jobs, whatever. But yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. What's your thought process there? My thought process is um, I got this far. So go back to where we started this conversation. Crown Heights, all my friends in boxes. Start there and then you in this story and it's like I knew there was something else. I knew there was something else. But I've always done it by betting on me and I bet on my instincts. And my instincts told me that the success I created at Beats – I didn't feel the lane. I didn't feel like I was the right fit to do that mm -hmm. where I was. And even throughout all your success at Beats, no, but again, it was over. Like, I mean, once you sell the company, you you know this. We're about to share here because it's like, you know, it's always great to sell your company because you make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But then it typically changes, mm -hmm. and the company changed. Yeah, it's not a matter of if; it's when it's going to change. It might change right. in day sixty, right. you know, months six or year six, but it's going to change. Yeah, it's just but no, no, change is. I tell everybody: a hundred million dollar company. I mean, a sixty million dollar company versus a hundred million dollar company versus a five hundred. Those are all different companies, right? And you got to be a different executive at every 
stage of those companies. That's a great point. Or you get left behind. You know that. You're exp- as you grow, point. you feel yeah, that. Absolutely. And what it takes to be one number, it's a whole different skill set to get to the next. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, I just was like, yo, I, I had done it, but I knew there was something else. Hmm. And it was that time. It was that time. And I knew I would find it by betting on myself more than betting on another group of executives because, uh, to your point, like there are jobs out there. There's still mm-hmm. jobs today mm-hmm. that I could take. But and, go. And, and, you, and you guys, you know, the seven of you watching this podcast <laughs> – and the ten of you listening to it, um, you, you gotta you add know, my mom. Now. I, if you got my mom, no, we out of here with church. my dudes. Yeah, mom, we out of here. My, when Patricia that off, is that, on. O- that offering plate goes by. <laughs> yes, we out of here with my dukes. But I, I just want to, I want to provide a little bit of context and like as my world evolved, and I had access to, <clears> you know, tons of brands and c- CEOs and executives and all those things, right? And you and my relationship, we're brothers. You and my mm-hmm. relationship, right, had been like, it's like bigger than job, client, any of that yeah, shit. Yeah. I personally came to you, yep. and Mav personally came to you with opportunities. Like, yo, yep. we're not going to say brands, but like, yo, that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. All you got to do is say yes, this job's yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were like, no, nah, I'm good. Let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you what was happening. So, you know, what will happen, and this happens to a lot of talent that looks like us, is and it's, it's not a function of our friendship, but it's like I had done a decent job as a CMO. And what everybody was bringing me were CMO jobs. Mm-hmm. Now, if you just look at the CMO genre as a whole, it's in a very weird space. Like NFL running backs got more tenure than, C, than, than CMOs, mm-hmm. right? Because you, you get the cool guy that knows all the hot marketing. He comes into your company. First year, he does meetings, learns about the company. Second year, he's still in meetings, and then he starts to do marketing. At that point, he starts to lose his edge. And either he hits a home run or he doesn't, or she, Mm -hmm. right? And for me, I've always been a revenue guy. I wasn't a CMO. Like, as much as I had the title, like, I was a, we talk revenue. Absolutely. You you know that from our meetings. That's facts. Right? We never had a conversation that didn't end with what? Dollars. Mm Mm-hmm. What we spending, what we making. Yep. You and I were, were relentless, and that's what's this we'll, mean for we'll, the bottom line. Yep. We will never get the credit for that, facts, because we actually have taste, right? But you and I, and I know I know how we work. It was always about the money in the bottom line. So as much as I enjoyed being a CMO, like I just felt like I was in a different space, and I wanted to focus more on like how do we go build businesses. I look at myself now more as a CRO, like a revenue officer. Like that's the kind of work mm-hmm. I want to do because I want to build businesses. Because I know if I build them and I participate in them, I make money. My family does okay. Mm-hmm. The CMO side of the business is used to be in a cost center. By the way, I've been to your home. Your family's doing no, stop, more than stop. okay. I just want I mean, to <laughs> keep it in facts. Let's keep it facts. Your family's doing more the, than the, okay. The I've, been, I've been in the home. I won't say the neighborhood. I've been in the home. The, the fam is fine. But, <laughs> <laughs> the fam is fine. Hey. I'm gonna go here now because hey, yesterday I went to the top. Of, I went to the top of the I World Trade it. Center, <laughs> and I'm like looking at the entire city, mm-hmm. and I just see this building mm-hmm. that I can't, I, can't, I know this building. This building looks familiar. Mm-hmm. I think one of our, one of my friends who's very close to me lives in the same building. It's this amazing building that's right. It's, it's one of the few buildings you can see from the top of the World Trade Center. I'm not gonna name no names, but <laughs> let's just let's stop there, <laughs> right? I see it. Uh, I'm not doing it. Back to you. <laughs> so, Back to you. So yeah, I mean, so so I, I just saw myself in a different space, and I still get all the CMO calls. But for me, I just look at that genre of talent; it's in a really weird space. No, and and, and I can you, you know it because you work with CMOs course, every day, of, of course. And 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 that's my point. That's the one thing I want to get across. It's like you literally put your money where your mouth is because you turn down some really big money jobs, really the hottest of the hot brands opportunities, and you're like, hey, humbled, appreciate it. Not what I'm trying to do. Yep. Which I think is the perfect transition to Opus. Yep. Yep. Talk to us a little about it. What is wow. Opus? Um, so look, I told someone the other day, I feel like I'm Professor X and I'm like collecting mutants. Um, <laughs> I've got, I've built this really amazing team. It's about 12 of us now. Okay. Um, the 12 people that you would never, ever see in the same room. Um, I got people from Netherlands, London, South Korea, Brooklyn, um, Kingston, Jamaica, Left Right City, Queens, like this team of people, and you know me for this, I've always pulled together really interesting people, and I've got this really interesting people that I've pulled together. We've been working for about a year. We've been doing it in stealth, because we've been experimenting. Mm-hmm. We've 
you know, it's funny because like we're set up like an agency, obviously, and we spent the whole year explaining why we were different. And then I was like, yo, we're an agency, which is better. So the company's been in business for about a year. It'll be a year and a couple of weeks. And, you know, life's good. Life's good. I remember asking you, we actually consulted on the name, right? We're trying to figure out, hey, what works, whatever. And you asked me, hey, what do you think of these three or whatever the case is? And I remember telling you, I'm like, man, I'm not going to front because that's not the relationship we have. We're very honest with each other, mm-hmm. candidly. Um, we want to impress I, each other. Of course. I, I, would of go, course. I would go that far. It's, yeah, not, it's, just, it's not a competitiveness. Yeah. It's yeah. like a man. Like, yeah. Oh, O's going to be proud of this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. you'll text me and be like, I see yeah. you. Yeah. You know, I see you. And I remember telling you, I don't clearly fully understand everything you're doing. But what I do know is I haven't seen you this excited in a very long time. Yeah. Where was that excitement coming? Why are you so excited um, about your new what, situation? What the excitement came from was we're doing exactly what I did at Beats. But at Beats, from my perspective, you know, I had a category I had to focus on, which was headphones. You know, I was relentless about selling headphones. Mm-hmm. The good news now is I got the same kind of team, but now we can focus on other categories. Mm-hmm. And we've picked some categories that we're really passionate about that we have deep vertical expertise in. So the magic of doing that, and we saw this across a couple few, a few brands that we had, when you start doing one thing in one category or another, they start to match up. And now I've got these synergies across a few categories. We don't work on many things, but the things we work on all work together. Mm. And I don't have the handcuffs of headphones on anymore. Mm. Now I can actually do stuff with a <laughs> We can do, I don't know if I'm supposed to say names, but like yeah, we, we can do stuff with that brand or like a new brand, like <laughs> which is like a, a, a Swedish hypercar. And then we have a bunch you of. You know, I like pro- when you talk that shit. You know, like you I know, talk, I like, I like when talk. you talk. Yeah, that yeah. Shit. <laughs> you know, how we do. Some wine and talk that shit. I like that. I'm like, but that's my, my guy. My point is, they start to work back and forth. There's one, a, a brand I'm super I'll excited pour about. Pour you some more wine. I appreciate that, that shit, while I'm man. talking my talk. But like, <laughs> literally, there's a, a you know, the, whether it's a brand like <laughs> or Truff, mm-hmm. um, truffle flavored hot sauce, which is amazing. Go buy it, please, everybody. It's, it's family business. But we we have these amazing brands that we get to work with every day. And um, most importantly, I'm proud of the people I get to do it with, mm-hmm. right? And I tell my team every day. It's You've like, always been like that from day one at Beats. It's yeah, always been we, about the we, team. We work like. harder for each other than anybody outside of our fucking doors. Mm. And as long as you keep that vibe in your business, we have that as a relationship. Always. Me and his brothers. Always. I'll work harder for you. Always. And you've always worked harder for me than anybody always. else. We can go three months without talking, without anything. And it's like, yo, what you need? I need you. Whatever you need. Done. 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 It's already sent off an email. So my point is like it's I've I've built that essence again and it's like it's the same, it's a very similar team. It's almost like a, a radicalized version of what I built at Beats, and that's the team I've built at Opus. So we started at the beginning, ten year old Omar Johnson in yep. Brooklyn. You know, we're all the way up to Opus and what you're doing now. Yep. And all the amazing shit you've done in between. Um when it's all said and done and your name comes up yep. many, many years from now, yep. what do you want the narrative to be on Omar Johnson? It's going to be simple, fam. It's going to be, he built a platform where a lot of us could be ourselves and win at the same time. See, a lot of people, and, and guys, I have more 45-year-old white male friends than most guys, right? But the narrative has always been, like, that's how you got to be successful. I'm teaching my team, and, and we've always lived this, but you can be successful being yourself, if you're from Lower East Side, if you're from Left Right City, if you're from wherever you're from, mm-hmm. you bring that to work every day. If you're a mom, bring that to work every day. If you're a breastfeeding, black, female, Jamaican mother that's still nursing, you can be successful. She's on my team, mm-hmm. right? If you're Balkan and you got single mom and got two boys, she's on my team. So... At the end of the day, I want people. I want people to know, like, we've built platforms where no matter who you are, you bring your full self to work, you can win. Because I got introduced to that, and I've been able to win. Mm-hmm. So I want that platform. Because you notice, we have a lot of mentors and people that support us. They'll always say to you, "Give back to that next generation of you." Mm-hmm. And for me, I hope my legacy will be: I gave back, and I built a platform where other people like me and unlike me, but in that same situation. Mm-hmm of maybe not being, you know, Donald Trump Jr., mm-hmm. can do really well in this world. I think it's a perfect transition. The last question I have for you is we have a lot of uh, um, young, you know, viewers and listeners that are 
you know, they're in the grind. They're trying to figure it out. They have their own, you know, little brand. They're trying to make pop or they're, you know, trying to figure out if they should work <coughs> for themselves or, or you know, try to make it in the, the um, situation they're in now or move to a different role or move to yep. a different opportunity. What advice do you have for that, you know, 21, 22, 23-year-old, 19-year-old kid from Brooklyn that's trying to figure it out um, and maybe doesn't see a path necessarily? What advice do you have for that kid? Like, what's the best advice you'd give to 21-year-old Omar Johnson? I would tell 21-year-old Omar Johnson three things. I would say watch how your fears play out in your life. Because we have these fears that come from a lot of different places. And those tend to become our biggest limitations. Like my biggest fear is being controlled. Mm. So, you know, to your point, like when I left, a big point of me was like, yo, I'm going to control everything. <clears throat> now, I probably overdid it, but at the end of the day, like that's just my fear. And I've had to learn to get over that fear. And whatever your fear may be, you got to get over those fears. Because those fears will, nine times out of ten, nobody sees what you see in your head. Like your own internal dialogue and fears will be your biggest limitation if you let them be it. Because mm -hmm. most people don't see you that way. You know, but we have in our head what people see us as. It could have been something a teacher said. I had a guy, like I said, that guy, he said to me in a meeting, like in my end of the summer meeting, he's like, yo, you shouldn't be in brand management. You're not good at this. He said, you should probably do something in like sneakers or like music, which is all the black guys in marketing went to those two categories. That's exactly what it is. Hey, we did okay. <laughs> and, 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 and same and guy probably delivered my Postmates last night. No, no, no. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, Senior director at Petco. <laughs> I'm not fucking with you. Man. I looked him up. Get at me. Hey, Say shout something. Out, shout out to Petco. <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I digress. No. So I, I say number one, yes, number one. Two, I'd say have mentors. And I think the biggest mistake we make with mentors is we want our mentors to have like gray hair, be old. And it's like you and I have mentors that are younger than us. Of course. Right? We we started the show by saying we're exactly the same age, and we've mentored each other. Yes, at different points and, and in our, I was going right the journey. There. You've mentored me, right? I, I know there's ten decisions that I wouldn't have made if you were not sitting next to me. Maybe a hundred, right? I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of just minimizing for the show, but mm -hmm. you've you've influenced so many things in my personal life, professional life, like life, right? Mm -hmm. We have young people like a Karen Civil. Mm -hmm. Right, you think about a Cam McCullough. You think Karen, about the, the OGs, Cam, yeah. Ravi. Like we got these these young people around us who make us better. Mm -hmm. So I look at mentorship in a bunch of different directions. Yeah, I got the rabbis and I got the old guys and I got the OGs and I got the U's and but mentorship can come in any 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 from any person. And the other dimension of like mentorship is people ask like they make it like this big deal to ask, but they don't really realize the harder part in a relationship of a mentor and mentee is the mentee. Because if you say to me, oh, you should do something, and I see you six months after that, and I ain't did it, that's all, that's my bad. Because mm -hmm. eventually you're going to stop talking to me. Mm -hmm. You're like, I, I told him what to do, he's not doing it. Right. So the, the work is on the mentee. Mm -hmm. The asking part is easy. People love to talk about themselves and be mentors. So for me, it's like, get mentors and know what it is to be a mentee. Know what it is, the work, the burden's on you yes. to be a mentee. Yes. Last thing I would say is whenever you get into a business, understand what that business is about. And most businesses are about the same thing, which is what? Money and of revenue. Yep. Don't get in your head talking about my, my cool sneakers and spirit animals and can awards and all that crazy shit. Because at the end of the day, all those things are about getting to revenue. So <clears throat> if you kind of can work through those three things, your fears, you get great mentors and understand what the bottom line in the business is, you'll do okay. And that, that's what I would want someone to say to me when I was younger, because it, it would manage whatever like internal stuff I had going on. I get the in external inputs, and I would know what to focus it on, which is the revenue. Mm. Can't think of a better way to end the show. Before we get out of here, where can people and I stay on your ass? I know, social I know, media. I know exactly what you. Where about can to people do. follow I know you? Exactly what you're about to do. Where, where can they figure out what you're up to? What Opus is up to? Instagram, Twitter. Where, where can they, what? Who, how can they follow you? Yeah, right now there's nothing. Real talk. We need to fix you know that, this. Right? No, no. So, so we're, we're having this conversation. Um, by the end of the year, we're gonna we're gonna create a bit more of a social and digital presence. Okay. I took a little bit of a, a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I, I ain't gonna lie, fam. I really enjoy my anonymity. 
I, I like, I be moving, I be in New York, I hey, be everything, hey, and up. nobody knows. By the way, by the way, I'll, I'll leave you guys with this before we get out of here. When I went and met, oh, fuck, this had to be maybe a year ago at this point, maybe eight months ago, in his L.A. office. I hadn't seen him in a while. Yo, O looked like Tom Hanks in Castaway. His beard was nuts. His hairline was crazy. He hadn't gotten a cut. And I'm like, bro, I'm like, bro, are you good? He was like, I've been grinding, dog. <laughs> You were it's so true. locked true. in. So when I you say you in. stealth, and when you say you took a vacation, it wasn't a vacation. You was off the grid grinding. Not Apple created that whole screen time thing. And I realized because we play so much of our game and social and digital and, 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 and internet, like I was always in my phone. And like I think for, for me, for my family, for everybody, I had to get the dreaming again. I had to get my head about the phone and get back into the world. So I just took a little bit of break. But I'll be back. You back? Yeah, yeah be back. Brother. Oh, always. Appreciate you. Yeah. Omar Johnson, people. Peace. Peace.